All right, welcome back to another episode of the Walk on Red Shirts. Today, we are jumping into Group of Five talk with our own Group of Five specialist, Justin Kripe, and talking about the American. Thank you for joining today, Justin. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Looking forward if to you're it. Not, if you're not following Justin on the site, he is an aficionado uh, specialist, uh, is somebody who takes a look at the conferences who deserve a little more attention. Um, does a lot of weekly articles, a lot of posts about the group of five conferences, looks at a lot of their teams, a lot of their players. Um, last year, he did a pretty much a weekly article of uh, good things and bad things that came out of the group of five every week. And I think you're planning on doing something like that again. Yeah, absolutely. G G5 thoughts is kind of the, the theme with it. So, uh, so today we're going to jump in and talk about the American Athletic Conference because you know, th this is a very intriguing conference. Um, you know, looking at the surface level, Cincinnati, Houston, and UCF are all out of the conference. They're all off to the Big 12. There's still some pretty good teams in this conference, especially when you talk about that they're adding six teams. Florida Atlantic, UTSA, Charlotte, North Texas, UAB, and Rice. So just looking at those six, which ones intrigue you the most that are joining this conference? Well, obviously, the the headliner of that group is UTSA. Uh, they've won the Conference USA the past two years, and they're bringing pretty much their entire team that has taken them to that point. Uh, you know, Frank Harris, their quarterback, is a sixth or seventh year guy. He's been there forever. Uh, they have studs all over the offense. And uh, other than Zachary Franklin, receiver who transferred to Ole Miss, they have pretty much everybody back. So uh, that's a team that's going to immediately come in and be a factor in the AAC. Um, you've got FAU, who is consistently good, but uh, they've hired Tom Herman. To they've had some pretty interesting coaches over the last like 10 years. When you look at Lane Kiffin, Willie Taggart, now Tom Herman, they seem like they're almost like the school for rehab. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't in Willie Taggart's case. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I'm not the biggest Willie Tiger fan in the world, but I'm also admittedly a Florida State fan, so uh, a little bias when it comes to that. Hey, we love bias here. Absolutely. Um, but I believe Tom Herman is going to be a really good hire. He, he took a year off, actually. And I think I could tell from the media day, I watched a little bit of, of FAU's media day, um, he feels very reinvigorated, re-energized. Uh, FAU obviously kind of has a lot of momentum going because of the success of their basketball program. So that's got some uh, buzz around the, the university. Um, and if that can carry over in any way, shape or form to the football team, I think they have a chance to be very successful. Um, they're, they're able to get in some, some transfers. Um, Casey Thompson, former Texas quarterback and Nebraska quarterback. He, he's the guy there this year. Um, they have arguably the best running back in the conference in Larry McCammon. Um, so they've got some talent there. Um, so they're not going to feel out of place by any means in the conference. Yeah, I think FAU is one that intrigues me the most just because it seems like they have had some, I don't want to say incredible season, but they, they've been up a fair amount. Uh, obviously the Willie Taggart years weren't good, but Lane Kiffin made them an interesting program. They were never anybody that was going to go 10 or 11 wins, but they were making bowl games. UTSA, obviously this year, incredibly intriguing with Frank Harris being on that team. Uh, I don't know about what the other four are really going to look like, you know, five years from now. Rice has never really seen to put it together. UAB obviously put the program down, came back, uh, why am I blanking on their head coach's name? That was Bill uh, Clark. Clark. Bill Clark, you know, brought it back. He took him to a bowl game in the first season. You know, all these programs are in incredibly rich talent areas in the South and the Southeast. So there's no reason that they can't be competitive, especially with the age of the transfer portal. You know, half the guys we're talking about were at Power 5 programs at one point or the other. And for whatever reason, now they are in the American Athletic Conference. Um, so one program that has been here for a little bit is Tulane and Tulane is coming off one of the best group of five seasons in the last decade. They beat the Heisman trophy winner in the cotton bowl. They had an incredible comeback that they win in exciting fashion. They return the Willie Fritz at head coach, 
Michael Pratt comes back. There's a lot of rumors of what was going to happen, and both of them end up back coming back to Tulane. What, looking at Tulane, what do you think they need to do to repeat? It's going to be tough. Um, you know, they they need Michael Pratt to be the version of Michael Pratt that was there last year and not the version from two years ago. Uh, a lot of people forget it was not that long ago that Tulane was two and 10 uh, and things had kind of spiraled. Willie Fritz was on the hot seat. They were, they were not an upper echelon team in the AAC. Um, last year, things kind of came together, a little bit of a Tulane magic. Um, but I think they really need to, sustain that um they've, they've got real positive energy going there um i think michael pratt needs to sustain skill level he's probably the top guy him and frank harris are probably the top quarterback so he just has to be himself as far as that goes um the defense has to continue to be solid they were very good last year um they need to kind of keep that momentum going um i i think they have a very good chance to be at minimum an eight nine win team um because they do lose ucf they do lose houston they do lose cincinnati um they do replace them with some tough games um and we can deep dive the schedule later but you also got to look at their non-conference and their non-conference they take on southern miss who actually beat them last year and they actually have south alabama on their schedule this year who is probably one of the favorites in the Sun Belt. so um their, their schedule is going to be very difficult. So I think there's a very real chance that they could be as good as they were last year, but the record may not reflect it. Um, I don't think they're going to represent the group of five in a New Year's Six Bowl this year. I'll just say that right now. But uh, um, I, I think I think they have, they have the talent returning to s- stay up at the top of the conference, no doubt. Yeah, uh, the... They have some big names with Michael Pratt. He started to become a household name in college football. Uh, Willie Fritz, you know, ha- has been there for a little while. So I agree. The schedule is what scares me with them because those three non-conference games that start the year are not easy. Then you know, they have a game at Florida Atlantic and they end the season with UTSA. But I, I want to kind of dig in those a little bit later. But the schedule scares me a lot with this team that even like like you said they they could be a really really good team but they could get tripped up in teams that are just as good this year yeah i mean there's a very real chance it's it's obviously a long shot but their first three games home against south alabama home against old miss and then at southern miss they could be one and two uh that's not crazy and and if that's if that's the case then people are going to forget about last year real quick and they're oh, yeah. going to refocus and you know luckily none of those first three games are conference games so any any goals they have in terms of winning the conference would still be in front of them but right now they've got a a lot of positive momentum as the representative of the group of five Um, so so there's going to be opportunities for them to kind of showcase on behalf of of that level of competition that old miss game is going to be a huge one yeah so i want, want to look at the head coaches in the conference with all the new teams, there's also seven new head coaches. Some of them are joining the conference and uh, their team at the same time. Some of them were teams that are already in the conference. Trent Dilfer goes to UAB. Tom Herman goes to FAU. Brian Newberry goes to Navy. Alex Golish goes to USF. Biff Poggy goes to Charlotte. Eric Morris goes to North Texas. And Kevin Wilson goes to Tulsa. Give me one or two of those coaches that you think makes a splash in year one. And that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to win the conference, but maybe a team that, you know, before the season we're thinking wins three or four games, but all of a sudden they're winning seven or eight. Sure. Uh, well, we touched on Tom Herman a little bit. I, I think that's a, a home run of a hire. Uh, I think if he if he stays there for an extended period of time, I think he can really build something there. Uh, FAU's a brand, and, and, and that feels like a good marriage. So – uh, I think he is the best hire for the short term. Uh, Trent Dilfer is obviously the name that is going to generate the most buzz within the conference. His uh, experience at the coaching level is is not very high. Um, he 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 feels like 
the kind of hire that Jackson State made with Deion Sanders. It feels like an attempt at a splash, a big name. Um, whether he can get uh, the program up up to the highest level of the conference, I, I don't know. I don't think it's going to happen this year for sure. But if you're playing the long game, that could end up paying some dividends. Um, the one hire that I really like, though, was Eric Morris for North Texas. Um, North Texas, people forget last year they were the runner up in Conference USA. They ended up losing to UTSA in the championship game. And uh, when they played them in the regular season, it was a last second victory by, by uh, UTSA. So North Texas is a very good team. Um, they decided that they were just ready to make a change. And uh, Eric Morris is, uh, he was a former receiver for Texas Tech. So he's a Mike Leach guy. Um, so they're going to play the air raid style of offense. Um, they have a new quarterback coming in. They have Chandler Rogers, uh, who's a U UL Monroe transfer. Um, he, he was one of the few bright spots for UL Monroe. Um, but he, he's a dual threat type quarterback and North Texas has a terrific running game. So, uh, I, I think that is a team that if everything kind of comes together, they can make some noise. They can be a, a, a top half of the conference team. Um, I, I think. I think. I think they have the pieces to be a bowl team at least, and uh, hopefully he can kind of sustain something there, and then they can kind of establish themselves as as a team in the conference going forward. It's yeah, absolutely. I agree with you on the Tom Herman point. We saw what he did at Houston. Now, granted, one thing about Houston, he was from Texas. He was able to keep a lot of the kids in Houston home. I'm wondering if he'll be able to keep some of these kids in South Florida that might be considering some bigger schools to stay in Boca Raton, stay there. He, he seems like he knew what he was doing down in Houston, you know, able to keep Ed Oliver home. I don't necessarily expect him to keep a five-star player home, but some of those fringe players, you know, if he can keep them in, at FAU, that, that'll make a difference. And that's a big difference in a conference like the American, and, uh, the American Athletic Conference. I think that's one school that can really take advantage of the transfer portal. Um, I think they're, they're going to be easily be able to bring in players from maybe power fives that aren't getting the playing time they want because it's an easy sell. Boca Raton is an easy sell for a player. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so Absolutely. even if they're not getting the freshmen to come in, I think they can they can take advantage of the portal and, and maybe even an IL. But um, they're a team that that has the sustainability, no doubt. The other one that I like is Alex Golish at USF. And uh, this isn't going to be an easy rebuild, but I like what his career path is. You know, he's a guy who really didn't even have any experience playing. He was born in Russia. Uh, Went to Ohio State, but didn't actually play at Ohio State. He was like a high school football coach and just got hired on as like a quality control assistant or a GA or something like that. And then ended up traveling around. He was at Iowa State when Charlie Kohler was there. And uh, you know they were doing pretty well in the late 2010s. Goes down to U UCF, uh, joins with Josh Heupel, and you know, puts together a great offense as the offensive coordinator. You know, follows him to Tennessee. We saw what they've done the last two years. So if he's able to help that translate, he's going to score points. I don't mm -hmm. expect him to score points this year. I think seeing an improvement and being able to have an explosive offense at times is going to be the key. And then next year when they are able to use the portal again and show what their offense looks like, I think that will be the big point for them. I think they still might only win like four games this year, but – if they can do that and start to show what the offense could look like, they can bring more talent in. Yeah, I, I agree. They, they, they're they going to be a difficult team to prep for because of that. I think a problem that USF has is they've got a little bit of the little brother syndrome um, in terms of when U, UCF was there, they were kind of always looked as, as secondary to UCF. Now UCF's gone, but FAU comes in. And there's, there's that same kind of mindset where the school that's generating the buzz in Florida is not USF, which for being based in Tampa, they should be able to. Um, they don't have an on-campus facility. I think that's part of the problem too. So Yet, I think they are getting one, which should be huge. Yeah, yeah. When that, when, when that comes to fruition, that's going to be a big deal. Um, but it's, it's going to take some time for everything to come together. 
uh, it's not going to be a, an overnight build. So uh, hopefully Alex can, can, can build a foundation for that program and, and get it taken off. So let's take a look at some of the, the key players in this conference. Uh, so, uh, be before we do that, let's, let's, not, let's not leave out uh, Charlotte because uh, Biff, po <laughs> Biff Poggi uh, was at the media day. He was feeling a little slighted by teams uh, by the media by not asking him enough questions and giving him enough recognition and his team. So uh, I do want to mention him and, and the Charlotte 49er program. Uh, they do have a quarterback coming in, Jalen Jones, who actually started out at Florida. Um, and then he, of course, is a Michigan man himself. So uh, there are pieces there for sure. Uh, I don't think that is an overnight turnaround, but I think he is in a position. And I think Charlotte is a program that could ultimately be a sleeping giant down the road. That's that's another place that's very easy to recruit to. There's North Carolina talent all over and the ACC can't get them all. So I think if he can build something there, if he can get, you know, three, four wins this year and give fans some hope and optimism moving forward, I think that is a program down the road that can, that can actually be something in the conference. So, yeah, I could see Charlotte, you're in a major city there, so you can attract talent there. So I could absolutely see using that to help leverage your ability he brings in a handful of transfers from large power five conferences and brings in guys from Michigan, Ole Miss, Nebraska, Pitt. So there, there is going to be some talent on that team, but I don't think it'll be enough. Like you said, if he can somehow work his way to four or five wins, that's an incredible start to his career. And that, and that's kind of one of the things um, with the new look AAC, their plan was to, establish a footprint in larger markets. So, you know, it's easy to say that, well, this team is in a big city, so there's no reason they can't be good. Well, a lot of the teams in the conference now are in big cities, so it's kind of a level playing field. But, you know, Rice is in Dallas, so theoretically they could get some talent from there. You know, same with Charlotte, same with UTSA, even UAB, Birmingham, Alabama. Is a Please don't forget Temple in Philadelphia. Temple in Philadelphia, same same thing. So please do not um, forget us. No, no, of course the Mighty Owls. So we got a new logo today. Did you? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll make sure to put this out there. I'm still undetermined if I like it or not. Okay, okay. Just let it marinate for a while. Don't don't make any knee jerk reactions. Yeah, I, I, I'm I'm still un, undetermined if I like it. You know, <laughs> may, maybe it's okay. May, maybe it's bad. I, I haven't gotten there yet. I think uh, FAU and Temple battle of the Owls this year. So, oh, we, we need a we need a trophy between the yeah. Owls. Absolutely needs to be a trophy. Some sort of trophy between the two Owl teams. Uh, so let, let's jump into the key players in the conference. Okay, name me a handful of quarterbacks that you think are going to be difference makers for their teams this year. So the obvious two are Frank Harris and Michael Pratt. But uh, we already kind of talked about those two a little bit. So let's dig a little deeper. We, we did. We did. Uh, one name that jumps out to me is JT Daniels. Uh, for those Ooh, of you. Mr. Mr. On the go. Yes. Might, might have a stock in Greyhound at this point. Uh, yeah. Uh, he may not have quite been good enough at Georgia and he may not have been good enough at USC and he may not have even been good enough at West Virginia, but he's good enough at Rice to, to play. Um, I think. I think he is a guy who uh, can come in and, and Rice has a stud receiver to throw to in Luke McCaffrey. And they actually just lost a second receiver a couple weeks ago to the transfer portal. Um, he ended up going to NC State. So uh, the pieces were in place for Rice to be a very dangerous team. And I still think they can be. Um, but if JT Daniels can play to the level that he has played, I don't think he's ever been a bad quarterback. I think it's always been a, a, a an issue with circumstance. I think, you know, it's been injuries or it's been, you know, one thing or another. And then, you know, you know, Stetson Bennett while he pips him and then the rest is history. Um, We're not so far off from a JT Daniels winning a national championship at Georgia within this timeline. People forget because that. Georgia was good enough where there's a really good chance they would have made the national championship anyways. Yeah. And that defense was solid. And JT Daniels was the starter for the first four games or so of that season. They likely continue to go undefeated no matter who's quarterback that year. Yeah. And JT Daniels 
if he wins that national championship, is the quarterback at Georgia last year too. Yep. And he's probably – and he's in the pros now. I mean, he would be drafted, no doubt. So, No matter how good his talent is, if he won a national championship, somebody's going to take him because he won a championship. Whether it be a late-round pick or not, we wouldn't be talking about him at Rice, but here we are. Yeah. He's a Rice owl. Yeah, wild. Oh, my gosh, there's three owls in the conference. Uh, there are three owls. Um, so now now the trophy's not – now it's going to be a round robin, like a commander. It's got to be like – yeah, it got to be like the commander-in-chief trophy. Like it's got to be whoever is top owl. Yeah. Um, we could maybe workshop something there. I actually looked, and Temple does not play FAU this year, so that's mm. good. Uh, they actually need, need to make that a – need to make that a rivalry game. They actually don't play Rice either, so Temple's kind of – left out in the cold here but uh anyway so i think i think jt daniels is has a chance to be a difference maker for rice um another quarterback who who has that same opportunity is preston stone for smu he is a four-star recruit who actually has had opportunities to transfer out of the program but he sat and waited behind tanner mordecai uh and now it's his team and uh the potential is very high for that SMU team. And if he can play to the level that they expect him to, uh, that's a team that can absolutely threaten uh, the top of the conference. Yeah. Yeah. I have one more quarterback and I, it might sound biased, but I actually think he's going to be pretty good. And it's EJ Warner from temple okay. you know, son of hall of famer, Kurt Warner, who yeah. is the starting quarterback for temple. You know, he was a freshman last year. He came in uh, early in the season, it took uh, took over for Dwan Mathis because Dwan Mathis just wasn't doing it. And he ended up throwing for 3,000 yards. Temple's defense was terrible, mm-hmm. but EJ, EJ Warner proved that he could be something. You know, throwing for over 3,000 yards as a freshman is pretty hard to do, and he completed over 60% of his passes. The main thing is there's not a lot of weapons on this team. No, there are. There are not a lot of weapons, and Stan Drayton's only in year two. I think EJ Warner needs to stick around for another year or so to kind of see it grow. But I do like where EJ Warner is going with this program. Yeah, I agree. I think I think he, the potential is there for Warner to be uh, one of the top tier quarterbacks down the road. I do think he's probably a year away from from that status. Uh, maybe once once Pratt and Harris and kind of the the names are gone uh, and he's still there, assuming he doesn't transfer out, uh, he's got a chance and. If the young talent can develop um, down the road, I think Temple has a chance to be something. I just, I just don't think this year's that time. Absolutely. So there are a couple other players that we have on our list here. Tell me a couple other people you want to touch on as key players in this conference. Uh, one name we haven't talked a ton of defense. Um, one name that jumps out, I think, one of the better players uh, is Rashad Wisdom. He's a safety for UTSA. Uh, another guy who's been there, he'd been in the program three or four years. He actually had an injury last year, so he's recovering from a leg injury. Um, but he he was on the I think the Nagurski list came out today, and he was on that as one of the top defensive players in the nation. Um, he's definitely the 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 leader for that defense. Um, I think he's someone who can definitely be a standout. And if you notice in the NFL you're starting to see some UTSA names pop up in, especially in the second area. Tariq Woolen is a name that uh, may ring a bell to a lot of people. He's a cornerback for the Seahawks and he's, he's, I think he was on the NFL top 100 list that came out earlier this month. But anyways, uh, UTSA is getting those guys who, who are going to be pros and Rashad wisdom, in my opinion, is one of those guys. So uh, he's definitely someone to look out for. Um, Another name, I think I mentioned him a little bit earlier, but if you're looking for a running back, Larry McCammon is uh, a running back for FAU. He's he's a, He's been there for a couple of years. He's an established guy. Uh, I think he can definitely be a difference maker. Jermaine Brown is another running back. He's in UAB. He's replacing uh, Dwayne McBride, who got drafted. But they were kind of a one-two combo the past couple of years. So he's, he's a name that's been there. So for him to step in and be the guy this year is going to be key for UAB to, to make some noise in the conference. Yeah. I think one other offensive player is 
wide receiver Joshua Cephas from UTSA. Uh, he is one of Frank Harris's go-to guys, uh, just short of a thousand yards last year. Uh, I think he was in the upper seventies in catches. Or he actually had eighty-seven catches and six touchdowns last year. So gets looked at a lot. You know, just having that chemistry. You know, for another season. These guys are going to be a match made in heaven again this year. If you're yeah. looking for an exciting connection, UTSA, look for Frank Harris and Joshua Cephas. I would have fully anticipated that Cephas is going to go over 1,000 yards this year. Oh, no doubt. And and if uh, DeCorian Clark, he got hurt last at the end of last year also. If he's back and healthy, that one-two combination is probably bar none the best duo in the conference. Uh, if not all of the group of five, um, but there's some arguments that can be made elsewhere. But uh, um, yeah, the funny thing about the conference really is that a lot of the skill players, a lot of the top skill players are from the teams that are moving in. Um, if you, if you look at the ACC and the, the AAC and the teams that are left over, a lot of them are having down years. Um, Memphis is a little bit down. Uh, East Carolina lost Keaton Mitchell and Holden Ayers from last year. So I think they're going to be down. Navy's a little down. So there's opportunities for the newcomers to kind of come in and make an impact right away. So you're seeing a lot of those teams bringing a lot of returning talent into this conference because they see the opportunity that they can make. So um, I think I think the newcomers are are, are the teams to watch. I really do. So the only other player I wanted to mention is we'll give Biff Poggy one more moment here. Sure. Is uh, Yabi Okoye, who comes in from Michigan, who is also one of the top five players in the country when he's at Alabama, has bounced around to his fifth program now. But he was able to play at Michigan, and he had a, registered a handful of sacks in the Big Ten. So if he's able to get through Big Ten offensive lines, I have no doubt that he should be able to be a player for that Charlotte defense. He's not going to be a game changer. He's not going to be a game wrecker. But when the season comes, don't be surprised if you come back and he has seven sacks on the season yeah. because, you know, he helps one or two games, um, you know, helps keep him close, gets a couple of key sacks. Like I said, he's not going to be any bit of all American. He might not even be all conference. I just think that he has the talent to help Charlotte look like a legitimate team in the first year. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Um, it, it, it really is hard to understand why people are so down on Charlotte because they are bringing in players. Uh, they're, they're, you know, like you said, he's got a chance. He's played at the highest level. Um, he's, he's going to make an impact. They, they've got transfers from power fives all over the place. So that's a team that they really just need the chemistry. Um, there's talent there, no doubt. Um, it's just a matter of if it all comes together or not for, for a team like Charlotte. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I want to jump in and let's start talking about some of these teams here. Um, so first one, we haven't talked about them really at all, but I want to talk about SMU mm -hmm. because SMU seems like they could be a very interesting team this year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, they've got the perfect combination of talent and the schedule breaks right for them. Uh, if you looked at their schedule, you've noticed that they actually do not play UTSA or Tulane. So their conference slate really sets up nicely for them to make a run. That's why it's so important for Preston Stone to have, you know, half of half of the results that the expectations suggest that he could have, um, because it, it lines up really well for them. Um, Rhett Lashley's in his second year. Uh, he replaced. Sonny Dykes, who obviously went on to TCU and had the success he had there. Um, they do actually play at TCU this year, so that'll be an interesting game. Um, they also play at Oklahoma, so um, those two games will really give them a, a barometer in terms of where they're at. Um, if those games are even remotely competitive, then I think there's a very real chance that that they, they can make a very, very uh, – deep run in AAC. So um, SMU is definitely uh, a team to watch, no doubt. Yeah. They also use the transfer portal a lot in the mm -hmm. last year. Their defense was abysmal. Mm -hmm. I mean, they ranked 
worse than 100th in most major categories, scoring defense, rushing defense, total defense. Their pass defense was only 73rd, but it's still not very good. Their offense was in the top 20 in most categories, so they realized that they needed to make some changes. They tried to patchwork it. They went and got at least eight guys I pulled up from the transfer portal, and most of them from Power 5 schools. So they went and got a couple defensive backs from Miami. They got some guys from West Virginia. They got a guy from Liberty, one from Temple, Fresno Mm -hmm. State. They went and just basically took anybody they could to help patchwork their defense and try to figure it out because they understand the offense is good. They need to make the defense better. Yeah. So if they can make that defense better, they've got a legitimate shot at, you know, contending in the AAC. Mm-hmm. You know, their non-conference at Oklahoma, at TCU, not friendly games at all. No. Versus Louisiana Tech, that could be an interesting one. Prairie View A&M, they should win that game. But like you said, the conference schedule, you know, they avoid UTSA. They avoid, you know, uh, Tulane. So they could have a terrible non-conference and still contend for the conference championship. They don't play FAU either. <laughs> so really so they could of- avoid three the three best other uh, other three best teams in the conference and they might cakewalk their way into the championship game be- on that fact alone yeah yeah no doubt um everything sets up really well for them uh the counterpoint to that is i believe it was last year ucf had a very similar schedule in terms of uh they did not end up playing houston or cincinnati so in the preseason, it looked like they had kind of a cakewalk all the way to the conference. They did make it to the conference championship, but then obviously Tulane kind of comes out of nowhere. So there's a very real chance that somebody's going to do the same thing this year. A team you don't expect is going to make a move. And uh, that, that 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 road that SMU has that appears to be such a cakewalk is going to end up being more complicated than it appears. Yeah. The other thing on offense, what they did is their rushing attack struggled. Mm-hmm. They already had a decent running back room, but they went and got two more guys, LJ Johnson from AM and Jalen Knight from Miami, both guys who actually played at their schools. Plus they have former five-star Kamar Wheaton. Plus they have Tyler Levine and Velton Gardner. Their running back room could go pretty deep this year. So they can definitely rotate guys and figure out who the hot hand is. If some guy gets hurt, they're, they're able to go deep in that running back room. So I think that rushing attack could get stronger this season. Yeah, they absolutely could. I think Jalen Knighton has a chance to be an impact player, no doubt. Uh, I am a little bit worried about SMU's offensive line. Uh, They only bring back, I think, two starters. Um, They do have an all-conference type uh, center, so they've got a chance, but um, I don't I don't know if that's going to gel. I think that could be a hindrance for them. So um, but if it if it comes together, that rushing attack uh, can be very, very dangerous. So the, the next team I want to jump into, we've talked about them a little bit, but I want to give you a chance to start talking about UTSA. I know they are one of your favorite teams that you like to root for. So the floor is yours, Justin. Tell okay. us about tell us a little bit more about UTSA. So let me give a little backstory as to how this kind of came together. Uh, a couple of years ago, I've, I've been writing for Walk on Red Shirts. Uh, this will be my third year. Two years ago, when I did a conference preview for for Conference USA. At that time, they were kind of struggling to to find an identity. They needed a team to kind of step up and be that team to represent the conference for college football. And I just kind of looked at UTSA. I saw saw their schedule and how they played a little bit the year prior. And I'm like, they won, you know, four of their last five games or whatever it was. So I just kind of looked and I'm like, okay, they've got something here. Uh, they've got the resources. They've got they've got the market, San Antonio. Uh, why can't this be that team? So I just kind of put put it out there that you know this team's got a chance. And I remember the way their schedule lined up in 2021, and I'm like, you know what, this team can make a run. They played Illinois and they played Memphis, and and I'm like, you know, things have to break right, but there's talent here and, and I think this team can do something. So I put it out there into the world and, and sure enough, uh, things did kind of come together and, and they were undefeated up until the the season finale against North Texas. Uh, they lost that game, but they had kind of established themselves as, as that team. 
So I kind of just rode the wave. It's a little bit of a, a, a bandwagon. I kind of feel like I got out in front of it. Um, but uh, that's just kind of became my team. Um, it just so happens that all that talent that they had two years ago is still there. Um, so, you know, whether this is a short or a long-term situation, uh, that kind of remains to be seen. Obviously, I think they're going to be very, very good this year. But the reality is there's going to come a time when Frank Harris is out of eligibility and DeCorian Clark and Josh Cephas and uh, Oscar Cardenas, their tight end, and Rashad Wisdom and all these guys are gone. Um, I don't know if Jeff Trailer has built the depth through recruiting to make this a sustainable thing, but they're at least a brand now. And it's very easy to recruit two brands. So uh, I think this is a perfect opportunity for them to uh, move up to a higher level conference in the AAC. Uh, this is the perfect year for them to, they're going to have probably at least seven wins. Uh, they tend to play a tough non-conference schedule. So, uh, you know, they start off at Houston, they play Army, they have a game at Tennessee, um, so they play the games that will get them the most exposure. And as long as they put out a decent showing and don't, you know, embarrass themselves and get blown out, that's a, that's, that's a moral victory. So um, yeah, that's just a team that, that uh, I kind of feel like I, I uh, planted my flag into early on and uh, it's, it's, it's paid off pretty well for me. The one thing I'll say about UTSA that makes it interesting is I don't know if Jeff Trailer has any interest in leaving. He is a state of Texas guy. So in the state, how many programs would he actually leave for? Baylor, Baylor, TCU. I mean, I know TCU just made a national championship, but like still they're not at the, you know, the, they're not a consistent national championship contender. You know, uh, Frank Harris was getting nil money at utsa so it's not like he's in the middle of nowhere san antonio is a big big city so there are ways for them to recruit and bring kids in that are local like they don't have to go into all these other states around they can stay in texas and get the play best 50 to 100 players honestly it's probably best 100 to 100 to 150 in texas because there's so much talent they don't have to compete against Texas for the guys that they're going after. They don't have to compete against AM. They don't have to compete against Baylor. You know, even schools that are coming from out there to get the right guys that fit their program and also guys that aren't just looking to come in there, play one season, and leave. He's done a really good job of keeping his talent in house. Frank Harris, if he really wanted to, could have probably transferred and played at a bigger program. Sure. Like, there's no reason why he couldn't have done that, but he has chosen to stick it out at UTSA. All these guys could probably go and play a better program. I don't want to say better because that doesn't mean they're... Texas is not a better program sometimes. You know, yeah. they've been terrible. But at larger programs, in Power 5 programs, and he does a great job of getting his guys to stay. He uses the portal for the guys he needs, but he also home has homegrown talent in there. This could be something that sticks around. Obviously, next year could be a big transition year with losing some important guys off this team. Quarterback is obviously a very important spot. You have no idea what you're getting behind you because with limited playing, they may have to look at the portal. Who knows? But I like what he's built, and I think this could be sustainable. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think another thing working in their favor is they're kind of the only game in town when it comes to football. San Antonio doesn't have a pro team. So other than Victor Wimbanyana now – Frank Harris could be the biggest name in San Antonio as, as far as sports go. Um, you know, it was easy for the city to kind of rally behind them as they're successful. So um, the, a foundation has, has been laid for over the past couple of years for something, and hopefully it is sustainable. Um, you mentioned Jeff Trailer, uh, and you mentioned all those schools that he could potentially leave for. The funny thing is he had the opportunity the past couple of years you know, if TCU was an option and he didn't go and, you know, maybe they weren't interested, but I got to think they at least there was preliminary discussions. Um, Baylor, you know, Dave Aranda's only been there. He, this is his third year. So that's a recent 
opportunity that he could have had. Texas Tech, same thing. Joey McGuire's in his second year. That job would have been a perfect fit for him, but he he would rather stay at UTSA. So um, I think you're right. I think he is there for the long haul. So I think I think there's uh, with that in mind, there is a very real opportunity for that program to be at the top of that conference for the foreseeable future. The biggest competition for them this year, we already talked about them a little bit, Tulane. Mm -hmm. Tulane is the glorified team in the conference this year. They beat Caleb Williams in the Cotton Bowl. Mm -hmm. There was no bigger prize that they could have attained last year. So they're coming in with a target on their back. I don't know if Tulane is ready for what UTSA has to offer, but I know that if when the end of the season comes, that could be an incredibly fun matchup. Yeah, it, it definitely will. Um, I think Tulane has to be, they're in a, a unique position for them because they're now the hunted. Um, that is not something that they have had to deal with in recent history. Um, they've had years where they were successful. They had um, Tommy Bowden let him do an undefeated season back in the late 90s. Um, so they've had times where they have been very successful, but it has not been over a sustained period of time. There hasn't been the consistency. Um, so this year they have a target on their back and it's going to be by a lot more hungry teams and programs than that it would have been if Cincinnati and Houston and UCF were there. Um, I think those teams probably would have looked at Tulane and maybe dismiss their success last year and still would have seen themselves as superior to, to the green wave. Um, but now you've got a lot of up and coming programs that, that see that sweet, sweet uniform and they see a red and white bullseye on it. And they're, they're going to come to every game against Tulane and, and try to be the team to knock them off their perch. Yeah. And the schedule makers didn't do them any favors for their conference schedule. When you look at it, I mean, Memphis is not going to be an easy game on the road. They may be down a little bit, but they're still not a bad program. And that's a Friday night. Yeah, that's and a Friday night game, which weird things tend to happen on Friday, Thursday and Friday night game. Mm -hmm. you know, a game at Florida Atlantic and then back to back with UTSA. And then you, know, you, you have no idea what the North Texas, Rice, Eastern Carolina, and Tulsa could be. You've got to think at least one of those is going to have a winning record, if not more. And the non-conference slate with first team South Alabama, who could very well win their conference. Mm -hmm. Ole Miss with Lane Kiffin and is an SEC team who could all in likelihood win eight or nine games this year. And Southern Miss on the road who beat them last year. Like, there's not many games where you look on the schedule and go, yep, that's a guaranteed victory. Yeah, and, and I don't love – Tulane doesn't have a, a huge home field advantage, um, at least not compared to maybe the, the dome that UTSA plays in or or Memphis when they're when they're rocking or SMU. Um, those home field advantages feel more advantageous to those teams than Tulane's does. Um, now, that may be different this year now that they've got some success. But I mean, you think about last year, Southern Miss went to Tulane and won that game. Um there's a little bit of a rivalry there, a regional thing, but um, you know, that's a game that Tulane last year's Tulane team should have won. And uh, I think they are. So I think they're prone to two lapses and, um, and even that, that week one game at South, South against South Alabama, I think South Alabama is the best team in the Sun Belt, And I think they can absolutely go to Tulane and win that game. And if that happens, how does Tulane come back and how do they regroup? Because the next week they have Ole Miss and Quinshawn Judkins is possibly the best running back in the country. And I don't care how good Tulane's defense has been in the past. He's, he's kind of a different guy. Um, so they have to be, they have to be locked in. And then obviously if he shreds them um, the next week, they have to face Frank Gore jr. So uh, I think key for Tulane is going to be their run defense, and they're going to be tested very early, very often. And on the opposite side of the ball, they got to replace Tajay Spears. And mm -hmm. Spears was a pretty darn good running back for them last year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, he's a pro now. He got drafted. Um, he, uh, 
I think somebody is going to step up. Um, they've got some young guys there to, to potentially carry the ball. They didn't uh, get any transfers, any impact transfers that I know of. So um, they got shady Clayton Johnson from Kansas state, but he only had, he only played sparingly throughout the season because they had Deuce Vaughn. They didn't need a running back. So you don't really know what you're getting out of him with a transfer yeah. from Kansas state. Yeah. But they do return. They return four guys on their offensive line. Um, so I think somebody's going to get yards. I'm not overly worried about it. Um, I don't know if he can have the impact that Spears had, but if he can at least offer some balance to 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 balance out Pratt, so he's not completely dependent on the passing game, then I think they'll be okay. But uh, it may take some time for them to gel. We've talked about FAU a little bit. Let's dive into them a little further because I really like Tom Herman at this level. I don't know if Tom Herman is the best fit long-term at a true power five conference, but one where there isn't as many eyes on him and he can work at a program that has resources. It feels like this could be an interesting year. Like they do have a difficult schedule with, two pretty tough non-conference games, mm -hmm. but it wouldn't surprise me if they pull off an upset or two this year and, you know, reach like an eight win mark. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, just kind of looking at, at Florida Atlantic schedule, their first two games, Monmouth and Ohio are both home games. Um, Ohio, I think is going to be very, very good. So that is not a gimme by any chance, any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> But if they can go into those non-conference games that you mentioned, which are at Clemson and at Illinois, if they can go into those 2-0, and they're going to have some confidence that, that they can pull off an upset. Uh, I think the Illinois one is a lot more likely than the Clemson one. I would but, agree with that one. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, if they come out of that 2-2 two and two, um, going into their conference slate, I think they'll be fine. Um, Casey Thompson – He's been good, not great uh, over his career. Uh, they also have Daniel Richardson, who's transferred in from Central Michigan. Uh, he was the quarterback the past couple of years uh, before Burt Emanuel Jr. kind of took over that at the back half of last year. But um, So they've got two guys that are very, very capable, especially at this level. Um, and, and their schedule also is, is pretty favorable. UTSA, they get at home. Um, Tulane, they get at home. And they don't play SMU, as we mentioned. So uh, their their road slate is not overly daunting uh, at USF, which, I mean, that's, they stay in state. So, you know, I wouldn't expect to be overwhelmed there. Um, at Charlotte, at UAB, and then they end at Rice. So in in what we're calling the Owl Bowl for now, I guess. So, um, so, so yeah, there's definitely a chance for them to, to at least make a, eight wins or so. They're at minimum a bowl team. Tom Herman also seems to do well when he's got good running backs. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, he was the offensive coordinator at Ohio State when Ezekiel Elliott went off and they won a national championship. You know, he goes down to uh, Florida or Florida. He goes down to Houston and you know develops a running game there. Uh, he also had a dynamic quarterback who could run, and he's got two pretty good running backs on trans or two pretty good running backs on the roster, and he also added a transfer as well with Larry McCammon and Zuberi Mobley. And then he also adds Kobe Lewis, who had a 1,000 yards at Central Michigan before transferring to Purdue. So that's a pretty deep running back room. And you can get creative, especially with how some of those guys can play. You, know, you can split some guys out wide. You know, that don't have to technically be in like an I formation. You can get into some pistol formation. He can get creative with the play calling. And he did that at Houston. He did that at Texas. He did that at Ohio State. So I fully expect him to get creative with having talented guys on this team. Yeah, and and, and they have uh, – their receivers are talented, but they're not overly consistent. Um, LeJonte Wester is kind of their stud. Um, he, he's a playmaker for them. So – and the other nice thing, like you mentioned, their quarterbacks are dual threats. So they can get out and they can make plays with their legs as well. So if the running game is clicking, that offense is going to be very potent. Yeah, I, I think I think they're going to upset somebody. I don't necessarily know. It's not going to be Clemson. I'm just going to put that on record now. But 
Illinois, UTSA, Tulane. I think they beat one team. I don't know what the circumstances will be. One of them is on the road, but Tulane and UTSA are at home. I think they pull an upset in one of those two games. Maybe Illinois. I, w- I would not be surprised if they beat Illinois either. Um, I'm not overly high on Illinois um, just because they got a new coach. They're breaking in some kind of some new their players on offense. You know, Luke Altmyers, our quarterback. I don't know. You probably covered all that in the Big Ten preview. So I'm not yeah, they're, Illinois is an interesting program this year. I'm not really sure what to make of them. They could make the Big Ten West Championship, but they'd make it at like nine and three. They also could go seven and five. They could go six and six. They got a good defense. Nobody really knows what Luke Altmeyer is because he never really played at Auburn or Ole Miss. Never mm-hmm. really played there. They're play- you're seeing a running back of Chase Brown. Their defense should still be good, but like they're going to average like 17 points a game. So they're going to yeah. win a bunch of games at like 17 to 14. So if Tom Herman can figure out a way to make this offense roll, he could certainly beat Illinois. The, the problem with FAU, and it's the same problem that a lot of teams at this level in this conference have, is there's no dominant defenses. There's no teams on defense that can stand up to power five level defenses, the physicality of it specifically. So um, FAU can probably get manhandled pretty good on that side of the ball. So that's going to be a problem. Um, but when they're playing conference foes, that's that's going to kind of level itself out. Um it's but that's where I could also see Tom Herman get creative. And instead of trying to run between the tackles, you know, splitting guys out wide, doing sweeps, doing tosses, getting guys in the boundary where they could have one on one matchups instead of going against Big Ten linebackers. Yeah. yeah. So it, it wouldn't shock me in the least. I do think the Tulane and the UTSA games are much more likely. Yeah. Uh, what is another team that really sticks out to you in this conference? Uh, I touched on them a little bit earlier, but I am probably stubbornly high on Rice. Um, you know, they, they're the school, they're the school who's basically in because of academics more so than the athletics that they provide. Um, but you look at, at power five levels, you get your Stanford's and you've got your Northwestern's who may not be consistently the upper echelon of their conference, but every once in a while they can have a year where they, kind of everything comes together and and they threaten the top of the conference that they're in. Um, I think Rice has the potential to be that team behind JT Daniels. Um, They have, they have a a really good passing game. Um, They're going to put up points. Uh, Their defense is very, very sketchy. Um, So that's going to be where they're going to have some problems. They've got some decent secondary players, but um, they're a small team. So they could get pushed around quite a bit. Um, But that really only affects them, like we touched on, in a couple of games where, you know, week one they play at Texas, that's going to be a problem. Um, They play at UTSA, that's probably going to be a problem. Um, But they play Houston. Last year they played them very tough in a non-conference game. Um, SMU, you know, they can, if, if it gets to be a shootout, they can put up points with a team like SMU. Um, so I don't know if they are a sustainable program going forward long-term, but for this year, I think they have a chance to be a bowl team, no doubt. Um, they were a bowl team last year, even though they got in kind of on a technicality as a five and seven team, they got in, they got in cause they're nerds. They got in because they're nerds, yeah. Because um, they were had the highest APR rating of all the five and seven teams, so of course it defaults to the nerd schools like the Rice, the Stanford, the Northwestern, the Vanderbilts of the world. Sure, yeah, uh, but you know what? Nerds need some love too, I guess. So they they got in on it, so it's all all that matters. Yeah, but there, I mean, there are games to be won on that schedule, no doubt. Um, you know, they got Texas Southern, they've got East Carolina, they've got Connecticut, they've got Tulsa. Those are teams that they can beat. Um, it's just how they perform against the highest uh, part of the conference that will really determine how how good they yeah. are. Yeah, they should be an exciting team. JT Daniels brings a lot of experience, a lot of starting experience you know, between USC, Georgia, West Virginia. Brings two pretty good wide receivers. Luke McCaffrey, shout out Christian McCaffrey's brother, former mm-hmm. Nebraska quarterback, pulling the David Sills route, if everybody remembers the – West Virginia quarterback that was originally committed to USC as an eighth grader 
went to US or went to West Virginia as a quarterback, came back as a wide receiver, became basically the blit, one of the Blitnikoff finalists. But Luke McCaffrey went for like 700 yards as a wide receiver last year. So it's he's only going to get better as a wide receiver. He's only been playing for one season as a wide receiver. So he's only going to continue to get better and having a good quarterback just is going to help that even further. Yeah. It's it's really a shame that uh Bradley Rosner is kind of the other cor- uh, the other receiver for that team. He transferred to NC State, but he had like he had double digit touchdowns last year. So they they together were very potent. Somebody's going to have to step up to replace Rosner this year. If they can find a, a good number two, then that offense can kind of keep the momentum they had last year and they can keep humming. So it's it's going to be important to find that guy. Um, but if they do, I think that team really has a chance to make some noise. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And there's another team we haven't actually talked about. We haven't talked the about Temple Owls. No. Um, okay. That's sick, fine. We can keep going. A, uh, sick uh, new logo, by the way, though. I did see that. Um, no, Navy. Um, they have a new coach coming in. Um, Kenny and Nia Matalolo is gone. And they kind of just, I think they kind of were ready for a change there. So they brought in, well, Brian Newberry is the new head coach. He was their offensive coordinator. So I don't know that they're making a, a, a drastic change. But can you really make a drastic change at schools like this, though? Because you have to play a certain style of offense. And you're obviously very, very limited in even be able to recruit. So it, it feels like it's, it is a hard job to bring somebody outside in. You're right. I think, though, the one thing that is in their favor is those new teams that are coming in are not going to be used to the triple option. So I do think that they have a chance to benefit the most from the six new teams because they're a tough team to prepare for. And, you know, North Texas has never seen Navy or at least not in recent memory. Um, Even a team like FAU, that's that game is going to wear on them. And Navy, whether they have the guys or not, they have the style of offense that can be punishing. So um, I think they do benefit from the possibility of some new blood in the conference. Um, they may be a team that, that uh, win some games that maybe they wouldn't have won last year as a result. So uh, that is a team that has possibility to, to, to get close to bowl eligibility. And of course they play air force and army and, and those rivalries too. So. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm interested to see what they look like because you make a really good point there. There's teams that have never seen what they look like, so they're not used to the triple option and the style of game and the blocking schemes that go with it. And you know, defensive ends just can't crash down because if they crash, then all of a sudden you know the quarterback pitches it. There's seven other guys that can get the ball. You just never know what it's going to be, and it's truly assignment football. And if some of these defenses aren't ready for that, then certainly they can pull an upset, especially because it's all about ball control. If Navy takes the ball for a nine minute drive, that's nine minutes that another team doesn't have the ball. Mm -hmm. It keeps keeps those quarterbacks that we talked about on the sideline. So exactly. um, Which makes every drive just that more important. And Navy's defense wasn't terrible last year. You know, they were very good against the run. They got a bunch of sacks. They did pretty well, honestly, for only winning four games. Mm -hmm. So if their offense can figure it out, I can certainly see them making it back to a bowl game this year. You know, that first game against Notre Dame, I don't think we're actually going to learn that much in that Notre Dame game. I think it's going to take until week three, week four, when they start playing conference opponents again. And North Texas is that first team that gets to face them in the American Athletic Conference. Uh, I, uh, well, at Memphis, I think is week. I, I meant like the new, oh, of the new, yeah. of like the, the new teams joining in because Memphis and South Florida, they've been playing them for years, yeah. but North Texas in week five and then Charlotte in week six, those are two teams that have never faced them or at least in recent years. And this will be a whole new experience for them. Yeah. It, it it's good that Navy plays Notre Dame every year and they get that game week one this year so they can kind of get it out of the way and kind of with it being in Ireland, it's, it's almost its own entity and, and independent of the rest of their schedule. So, you know, go to Ireland, have a great experience. There's a two week break before they play the next team then. So they get two weeks to come back and before they play Wagner. 
Yeah. So that's, that's going to be a cool experience. You know, they'll probably get beat by 35, 40 points or whatever, but then they can move forward and they can focus on the rest of their schedule, which does set up relatively well for them. So that may be a team to keep an eye on. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I I could see that giving a couple of the teams troubles this year. Mm -hmm. Uh, You mentioned this other team at the beginning, and I I just want to take a brief second to look at them. North Texas, North Texas went to a bowl game. They went seven and seven last year, you know, made their conference championship game before losing to UTSA. What are the expectations for a new coach this year? Well, I think the expectations are probably higher than they should be, to be honest. Um, Yeah, I mentioned the success they had last year getting to the conference title game. Then they let Seth Luttrell go, which felt like kind of a curious move, but I guess they had felt that they had kind of stagnated and moving to a new conference. They wanted to make a bigger splash, find someone who could kind of take him to that next level. Um, Eric Morris does not have a ton of coaching experience. Um, I believe he's only 36, 37. He's um, young. He's yeah. very young. Yeah. And he, but he did coach some at like incarnate word. Um, so he, he, he knows the style that he wants to play and it's going to be up and down. Um, the problem is North Texas, their identity has tended to be more of a running game and good defense. They actually do play very good defense, uh, as far as conference USA is concerned. So take it for what it's worth, but, and they bring back a lot of that. They bring back eight starters from last year. So their identity is going to be mixed in with the air raid style. So they're, if they can find that sweet spot where, um, Ikeika Ragsdale, I want to make sure I get that first name, right. But, um, him and IO a day, they are a one, two combination. That is very, very good. Um, they were doing damage last year. I actually saw them play in person against UTEP last year. So um, th- that's a very formidable one-two punch. So if they can still have the running game that they have, coupled with the air raid that Eric Morris is going to bring, and Chandler Rogers can do what he needs to do at the quarterback position to take him to that next level, um, they've got a lot in place that they can they can definitely be a dark horse. Yeah, I, I think there's one connection that – will help some people understand is uh, he was the head coach at Incarnate Word and uh, Cameron Ward was his quarterback for one season. Cameron Ward was so good that he transferred to Washington State that next year and became the immediate starter for the Cougars. So he can identify some talent and he's a pretty good coach. He knows Texas, which is important for Mm -hmm. all these small schools because you need to be able to bring in players in or you need to be able to tr- recruit transfers because a lot of times when they're coming to North Texas, it's because they're coming home. They're coming back towards somewhere they're f- comfortable, they're familiar. So a young guy that can relate and has relationships with coaches, he could have success. I could see North Texas in two, three, four years being one of the crown jewels of this conference. Yeah, yeah, I definitely do. Um, they're going to have – a struggle to kind of establish themselves um, with SMU and Rice and, and UTSA kind of all in the same area of Texas. Of course. Of course. Uh, so, so they're going to have to, to establish their identity and um, kind of stick with it. Um, so it, it could, it could be dicey for a while. They could get lost in the shuffle, but they could also um, establish themselves just as easily. So, I want you to make prediction. I want you to give me your two teams, and then I want you to give me who the conference champion is. Okay. So uh, the teams I have playing in the conference title game are UTSA and SMU. Uh, I just – there's a little bit of bias with the UTSA, but also it's just the amount of returning talent that they have coming back. Um, It's just too hard to bet against them. And as far as SMU, I just think the schedule breaks right for them. Uh, Not having to play Tulane, not having to play UTSA, and not having to play FAU, they can't ask for a better opportunity to make a run at the conference title. Um, I I think Tulane is going to be good. I think they'll be maybe an 8-9 win team. But, you know, it could come down to tiebreakers. 
I, I just, I just think they're going to be the third team out in a two team championship game. You know, I was going to take the same exact thing as you were because SMU does have an easier schedule and I do really like UTSA, but no, I'm, I can't pick the same thing as you. So I'm going to take UTSA and Tulane, but I'm going to have UTSA winning that game. Um, I think, I think UTSA is just going to end up being one of the best teams in the overall country. I think by the end of the year, they could be looking at a top 15 ranking. There's a very good chance that they are representing the group of five in the New Year's Six Bowl game when it's all said and done. Uh, I know they play Tulane in week 12, so it might end up being a back-to-back matchup. But I think it, that's how it's going to set up. And having to be a team twice in a row is tough. Maybe they are 11-1. and one, They lose at Tulane. But twice in a row, I, I don't think Tulane can win two in a row. Yeah, I think – I think that game at Tennessee, I, I don't, I'm not predicting UTSA to beat Tennessee. So everyone slow their roll, but I think a decent showing in that game, which will probably be a nationally televised game. will get enough eyes on them that they can kind of stake their claim in the conference. And if they do uh, kind of, I don't know if they're going to run the table or not, but if they do get on a roll going into that two lane game, um, there's going to be a lot of buzz about them. So um I think I think uh, UTSA. This is their year. Absolutely, it, it wouldn't shock me in the least if they put up a good fight. Tennessee has been known to drop games they shouldn't. They lost to Georgia Southern or Georgia State or one of those Georgia programs. Yeah, they lost to BYU in the mid- right when BYU wasn't very good either. That this it, it could happen. Tennessee was getting a little bit of a rebuild. Nobody's really sure what Joe Milton's got, but. They definitely are going to have more talent, but it wouldn't shock me if Tennessee isn't ready for this game either. I don't know who they've got before, but it wouldn't shock me if they're not ready for UTSA because they've never really heard of them, paid attention to them, not knowing that they've got a seventh year quarterback coming in. Yeah. And, and there's going to be a lot of orange in that stadium. It's just going to be two different shades of it. So yeah, I, I think that, that that's going to be one of the games I'm, looking forward to this year absolutely absolutely well justin appreciate you coming on thought that you gave some great insight you're definitely gonna have everybody tuned into the aac everybody's gonna be joining the utsa bandwagon because of you hop on board hop on. i'll save you all seat so perfect well that's been another episode of the walk on red shirts make sure to like subscribe Everything that you can do on a podcasting platform, leave comments, leave feedback. Let us know what you want to hear in future. Thanks again. You bet.